This is a chemistry GCSE tutorial within topic 10. This video will focus on ceramics, composites and polymers. In this video we will look at some examples of polymers, we will look at the properties of polymers, ceramics and composites and we'll have a look at evaluating the benefits of new materials compared to more traditional materials. Our big question is here. First of all, we will look at ceramics. Ceramics are non-metal solids that have very high melting points. Importantly, they aren't carbon-based, so we will not be looking at the carbon allotropes here. For example, they can be made out of clay or glass. Clay is a soft material when it's dug up from the ground. This means it's very useful for moulding into different shapes. However, when we treat it with heat, when we fire it in an oven, it hardens to form our ceramic. This means it has the ability to be moulded when wet and then hardened, which makes it perfect for making pottery and bricks. Glass is another ceramic material. It's another very useful material in the modern world, due to it being generally transparent. It can be moulded when it's hot, and then when it cools down, it becomes very brittle. Most glass used is soda lime glass. This is made by heating a mixture of limestone, sand, which is silicon oxide, and sodium carbonate, which is the soda part. In this, we heat this until it melts, and when it cools, it comes out as a glass. We can also make borosilicate glass, which has a much higher melting point than soda lime glass. This is used using a mixture of sand and boron trioxide. Borosilicate glass is used for most lab bottles within the lab. It's also used for Pyrex. Composites, on the other hand, are made of one material that's been embedded into another. To do this, fibres or fragments of a material are surrounded by a matrix that acts as a binder. This reinforces the second material. You need to know about four different types of composites. The first example of a composite we're going to look at is fibreglass, shown here. This is where fibres of glass are embedded into a matrix of polymer, into a plastic. This makes fibreglass a very useful material. Its properties is that it is low density, but is also very, very strong. Fibreglass is used for skis, boats and surfboards. It can also be used for insulation as it can trap air between the layers. So you may have fibreglass insulation, for example, in your loft. A second example of a composite is carbon fibre. Carbon fibre is a very highly used material. This is made by reinforcing long chains of carbon atoms or nanotubes. These composites are very, very strong and light. Due to this, they tend to be used in aerospace engineering, in the manufacture of Formula One cars, and in lots of high-end gadgets, for example, mobile phones. Our third example is concrete. Concrete is made of a mixture of sand and gravel that's been embedded in cement. So we're taking cement and turning it into a composite. Concrete is very, very strong. As such, it is the perfect thing to use as a building material. The final example of a composite we're going to look at is a natural composite, which is wood. Wood is a natural composite made of cellulose fibres in an organic polymer matrix. Wood is very, very strong, and we can use it as a building material amongst many, many other uses. Polymers are often used in place of traditional materials. We've looked at polymers before in much more detail in the polymer tutorial, which is part of topic 7, the organic chemistry unit. 
However, as a recap, polymers are repeated units, usually made up of hydrocarbons. Here we have our monomer, which is a small molecule, and our polymer, which is our long chain molecule made up of this repeated pattern of monomers. There are four types of polymers that you need to be able to talk about. The first two, low density and high density, depend on the catalyst that was used in order to make our polythene. So this affects the reaction conditions, so the temperature and pressure. The first is LD polyethene, or low density polyethene. This is used for bags and bottles, because it is very flexible. This is made under a moderate temperature and high pressure and with a catalyst. High density polyethene, however, is made at a much lower temperature and pressure and with a different catalyst. High density polyethene, or HDPE, is rigid. As such, it can be used for water tanks and drain pipes. You also need to know about two other types of polymers. These differ by how the chains of the polymer interact with each other. First, we have thermosoftening polymers. In these, we can easily melt and remould the polymer. This is because the individual polymer chains are entwined together with weak forces, so it doesn't take much energy to break these. Thermosetting polymers, on the other hand, are much stronger, much harder, and much more rigid. This is because the monomers form cross-links between the polymer chains, meaning the chains are held together in a solid structure. This means you need more energy in order to break these chains apart, and therefore they do not soften when they are heated. On the next slide, we will compare these materials as well as comparing them to metals. The three different types of new materials plus metals have different properties and therefore different uses. Ceramics, for example glass and clay, are insulators of both heat and electricity. They are brittle and they are stiff, so they're not flexible and they break easily. Polymers are also insulators of heat and electricity. However, they are much more flexible and easily moulded. We can use polymers for clothing and as an insulator in electrical items. Next up, we have composites. The properties of composites depend on the matrix and binder that the reinforcement has, so therefore their properties will differ depending on the type of composite, be that fibreglass, carbon fibre, concrete or wood. Finally, we have metals. As we've looked at previously, metals are great conductors of heat and electricity due to having their sea of delocalized electrons. They are also ductile and malleable, and they are stiff and strong. You need to be able to compare the properties and therefore the uses of these four materials. We can also compare the properties to alloys. We've looked at alloys before. Alloys are a mixture of metals. By mixing metals, this means that we disrupt the structure of the metals. This makes alloys harder than pure metals. There are many, many types of alloy. For example, alloys of iron are called steels and are often used instead of pure iron. Steels are made by adding small amounts of carbon and other metals to iron. We will look at steel on the next slide. For others to know are that copper and tin go together to make bronze, which is much harder than copper and can be used to make medals, decorative ornaments and statues. Brass, which is another copper alloy, this time with zinc, which is much more malleable than bronze and used in situations where we want lower friction, for example in water taps. Gold alloys are a great example. Most jewellery you would buy would not be pure gold. Pure gold is 24 karat gold. We can then work out the percentage of gold by working out the carats. For example, 12 karat gold would be 50% pure. 
And finally, we have aluminium alloys, which are used to make aircraft. Aluminium has a low density, which is really useful to make aircraft, but pure aluminium is too soft, so therefore we need to alloy it with other metals to make it stronger. Steel and gold are two alloys that you can be directly asked about. There are three types of steel that you need to know. The first is low carbon steel, which only contains between 0.1 and 0.3% carbon. This type of steel is easily shaped and can be used for car bodies. The second type of steel you need to know about is high carbon steel. This contains between 0.22 and 2.5% carbon. This is very strong, but is inflexible and brittle, so it would be used for bridges. Finally, we have stainless steel, which has chromium and sometimes nickel added. Stainless steel has a major advantage in that it is corrosion resistant, so it doesn't rust. It's also very hard. It can be used, as I'm sure you're aware, for cutlery. Finally, we have gold. Gold alloys are used to make jewellery. Pure gold is very, very soft, but is described as being 24 carat. We usually add zinc, copper and silver to harden the gold. As 24 carat gold is pure gold, we can work out how much gold is in a piece of jewellery. 18 karat gold means that 18 out of the 24 parts are pure gold, so 18 karat gold is 75% gold. 12 karat gold would be 50% gold, and so on. So providing that we know either the percentage of gold or the carat rating, we can work out the amount of gold in an item. In the next tutorial video in this topic 10 series, we will look over finite and renewable resources as well as recycling and life cycle assessment.